My name is Katrina Polinski and I am 44 years old and I live in the Bay of Plenty at the moment. but you know it's people don't chuck away quilts you don't find them in landfill um, they are things that are dragged from house to house through the families and um, even if they end up in the dog kennel you know people just don't want to throw them away because they're treasures myself occupied I tend to go into that black place and so I've trained myself to just um, turn off that road and shut down those thoughts because I don't need to go there again. I spent three years on one quilt which is on my bed that was a labour of love but um, it's not something I'm going to be stopping anytime soon I still have a passion for it even though I don't fully understand why. <laughs> I just make things all the time. I'm most fulfilled when I'm making something. I've just recently gone into business in um, a cooperative with four other artists, and we've opened a shop up that reuses and repurposes um, existing products. We don't import anything. It's, it's all handmade and it's all locally made, because we're trying to support local people and, and we just know that there's a whole lot of people out there who are very clever and don't have an outlet for their things. When I was growing up, no, I didn't have any ambitions at all. Um, didn't really have a clue. I think I just kind of floated around and whatever happened, happened. And I was one of those underachievers, you know, that could have done better but didn't. But I was just really unhappy and um, lost, I think. I kind of had a bit of a, a dysfunctional family, I suppose you'd say. I remember one night I came home and my mother was wasted and she was sitting on the couch with um, my stepfather's 308 on her lap and she was um, really drunk and, and I came in and she said, if I see your friend, I'm going to shoot her and I just looked at her and I just went to bed upstairs and off to bed because there was no talking to her when she was like that and um, in the morning I said what was happening last night and she says what I was cleaning the gun you know just denial just absolute denial about what she'd done and that was commonplace in my life you know really bizarre behavior even though she had this respectable job she um, you know, there were two sides to my mother, the one that everyone else saw and the one that we saw, and, and she was a drinker and a binge drinker on the weekends with her two bottles of Bernardino Spumante, it's called, it's a real cheap wine, and to this day I still can't drink um, wine. She just was pretty indifferent about her kids, I think. She was, a, she was an unusual woman. She... Um, there were never any discussions about my future or we never got into the deep and meaningfuls, ever. She wasn't an affectionate person. There was never a time that I can recall that she ever said she loved me or gave me a hug or anything like that. That never ever happened in our house. Not to me, not to my brother or my sister. No, well my parents split when I was about three or very young and there was no DPB back in those days. And um, I think she went straight to my stepfather and he was a Swiss immigrant. 
He came over when he was 19 and he used to drive trucks around Europe. And he came from a family of six and I think his father was a bit of a hard man. But that's all that I know about him because he never talked about his life either. He was really good to her but he didn't like uh, my brother and I. We didn't get on. There was a lot of conflict there and we were typical teenagers and a bit, um, you know, we played up a lot. We had no boundaries whatsoever. But I remember looking at other families thinking, oh, this is so different to my house, you know. The mother would give their kids hugs and stuff and, and that's all kid ever wants, really. So I've just made a point of being different to how she was. That's not how I am with my own children and because I know what effects that can have, being insecure and... Um, I used to ask about my father but she'd never want to talk about him and if she did it would be some horrible story. So um, just, you know, things like that. She never told me anything positive about him and, and I never met him until I was 27. I decided oh, I'll find him for my children as well, for them to have a grandfather because um, things yeah, weren't going well in my, with my family. And, the first thing he said to me was, I knew you'd ring me one day. And um, when I first met him, he said, um, oh, you're so beautiful. And he gave me a big hug. And that was a real highlight in my life. And I'm still, I have a really good relationship with him now. And I guess I could have carried over what my mother had said and believed her and, and all of that, but I just chose not to. And just knowing someone is so much like you, like I have the same facial structures and I'd never had that before and it was a that was a really neat thing to see someone see where I came from you know why I look the way I do two daughters and there's a 10 year gap between them and um, when my eldest daughter was 10, she was in her first year at intermediate, it was before school and they were um, having a fight, they were fighting as they did and um, I called her in for a lecture and I can remember it vividly because I was, I can see the weather and I can see my room and I can see her face because it was, uh, it was one of those days that you have that just change your life. And I guess that's why it's imprinted on my mind anyways. So she, I called her in to give her a lecture about being good to her sister. And, um, and she just went into what she calls her hedgehog mode, which is where she shuts down and she won't talk and um, just gets really quiet. And so I said to her, what's wrong? And she goes, um, I don't want to tell you because it'll, it'll split up our family. And my mother radar went up and I thought, oh, that's an unusual thing to say. And I said, um, just tell me and, and we'll deal with it. And she goes, well, when I go to granddad's house, he makes me touch him down there. And she pointed to it and I just, died a little bit and because I could see where this was going and it was so out of the blue and um, I said so how long has this been happening and she goes ever since I can remember it's always happened and so I died a little bit more and I think I started circling the planet at that stage but I just snapped back into mother mode and just calmly said, so um, what made you tell me that? And um, she said, well, I saw this, you know, in her cheerful way, I saw this um, ad on TV and it was about this man in a hotel room with a little girl. And I knew that something was wrong with that. And then it made me think about granddad, me and granddad, and um, I've kind of been thinking that maybe something wasn't right for a while but I didn't want to say anything but now I'm worried that um, 
you know, her younger sister was going to go through the same thing. And so I said, um, well, the first thing is that you never have to go to Granddad's house again. And I, I said, thank you for telling me. And I gave her a hug and tried not to cry. I asked her a few more questions about what had been happening and just to get a clearer picture. And I said, so what do you want to do, you know, because I'm going to take care of this. And she said, well, I'll just go to school. And she was fine. So she went to school, kept things normal. And I immediately went to my friend's house out of town. And um, she had another friend there and they were both mothers and with all our children the same age. And I just turned up at her house and I told her after I knocked on the door, I said, you know, it's my worst nightmare. And um, we just cried. We just cried and grieved over what had been taken from her because they all had kids and they knew. Yeah, so they helped me sort myself out and we made some decisions together and I'm so thankful that they were there because I was in shock. I drove back into town and I was going to the police station and I pulled over because I was thinking, because I was just raging. Things just got really weird after that. It was like someone had put a grenade in the middle of our family and just detonated it. Um, relationships were falling all over the place. Um, my mother stayed with him. She supported him. She told the police that she had um, stolen jewellery. She just made up stuff to make it look like she was a devious child and that she was sexually overt. I don't know why she did what she did. I never really had a discussion with her about it. The last time I ever spoke to her was before the court case. And I said, so what's happening? And she goes, I want you to know that I'm going to stay with him. And I've made up my mind and that's my decision. And she hung up on me. And that was the last time I ever spoke to my mother and we were estranged for many, many years after that until her death. My brother, just before the court case, wanted me to write a letter to the judge and explaining, asking for leniency. And I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it, you know. They were, and they were all visiting with him, you know. They were all rallying around him. And no one was really thinking about what my daughter had been through. He went to court and uh, the judge wasn't buying that. It only happened on a few occasions. Like he was trying to make out that it was only short term. It hadn't happened for very long and that she liked it is one of the things he said but that was his mental he was justifying it the judge said that i'm not um, under any illusions that this has been going on more than what you've said i would like to give you more than eight and a half years but that's what i'm going to give you with five years concurrent so he got the maximum for me my story and my part of, of it is that I think I just needed some encouragement that yes, I was still a good mother and because I went through a state of deep depression. Um, I couldn't sleep, I was an insomniac and um, I lost lots of weight, which I can't afford to do. And I was addicted to sleeping pills quite severely and um, that took a long time to sort that out. But I wasn't gonna let it beat me, you know, I wasn't. You have these things happen in your life and you come to a fork in the road and you've got to make a decision and I can fully understand why people go the I'm just going to abuse myself now, I'm just going to drink and to get myself into oblivion so I don't have to think about it. I totally get why people do that but it's better to go and think okay I'm going to overcome this, I'm going to um, learn from it, I'm not going to let it become who I am and that's what my daughter's done. She could have gone that way, but she's become a really successful, um, resilient person. That's what she told me was the biggest thing. She can cope with, she can cope with lots of stuff, and she's actually helped other young women. She's talked about her story quite often and shared that with others. She doesn't feel any shame about that, and nor should she. Um, it's a very hush-hush topic.
topic and it's quite shocking when people talk about it and they don't like to hear about it because it's not a feel-good story really. I think it's a valuable story and I hope it encourages anyone else who's going through it to um, take that step and, and say something to someone.